While everyone looked at the German machine guns of World War II, praising their incredibly high rate of fire and fearsome nicknames, in reality the Germans were having more trouble with American machine guns. But not just any machine guns, the heavy ones. The M2 Browning, the well-known heavy machine gun chambered in the 50 caliber BMG cartridge, is not something to laugh at when it's flying your way. The biggest problem for the Germans was that it was mounted on anything that had wheels, tracks or wings, even ships and boats, and there was never a shortage of ammunition, which the Germans couldn't say for themselves in the later stages of the war. So let's go through exactly why this weapon, designed near the end of World War I, is still in service a century later, in almost identical form to what it was back then. In the First World War, everyone learned fast that machine guns were decisive, but most of them still fired the same cartridges as infantry rifles. That was fine against soft targets, but then armoured airplanes and tanks started appearing on the battlefield. Suddenly, rifle and machine gun rounds weren't sufficient to deal with them, and because these new threats were here to stay and would only get better, someone had to think ahead and prepare to counter them. General John Pershing called for something with more authority than the 30 caliber guns in service, and that requirement went straight to none other than John Browning. The brief was to build a machine gun that fired a half-inch bullet at more than 2,700 feet per second. That was a serious leap from Browning's earlier work, but to save time, he took the dependable and familiar M1917 water-cooled gun as a starting point, then scaled the design so it could handle a much larger cartridge. The ammunition followed the same logic, Take the 30 6 concept, scale it up, keep it rimless so belts feed smoothly, and use lessons learned from a captured German 13.2mm anti-tank rifle round. Out of that came the 50 BMG, 127 by 99 millimeters. No one realized it yet, but they had just created a cartridge that was about to impact countless wars for decades to come. The first heavy gun to use it was the M1921, a water-cooled model intended mostly for anti-aircraft work. However, as soon as the army tested it in other roles, the drawbacks became obvious. An infantry team couldn't really operate with a gun that weighed about 120 pounds in its water-cooled form. The air-cooled version still came in around 84. Add a 44-pound tripod, and you end up with a ground setup between 130 and 170 pounds before even counting ammunition, which wasn't light either if you know how big the 50 BMG cartridge is. Recoil was substantial and made accurate fire difficult. Small aircraft of the day struggled to carry it. Early vehicle turrets were awkward because the gun could only feed from the left side. For a while, its most practical use was as a coastal anti-aircraft weapon and it looked like that might be the end of it. Browning died in 1926, but the design kept moving. Engineers reworked the internals so the feed could be switched left or right by changing the top cover. They built a universal receiver that accepted different barrel groups. You could fit a water-cooled barrel with a jacket, a heavy air-cooled barrel, or a light air-cooled barrel for aircraft. With a handful of other refinements, the system settled and took a new name, the M2 Browning. Around this time, many other countries shifted to 20 or 30 mm cannon for the same jobs. The United States stayed with the 50 on purpose. High velocity and an adaptable installation made it worth keeping in production. When World War II started, the United States already had M2s spread across the force. Fighters and bombers carried fixed guns. Ships and vehicles used them for anti-aircraft defense. Infantry units mounted them on tripods. Aircraft installations used lighter barrels and raised the rate of fire from roughly 500 rounds a minute to about 1,200. That put aircraft-tuned 50s in the general neighborhood of the MG-42 for rate of fire though they were fired in short bursts because a target in the air is only in your sights for a moment. You can see what this looked like in practice by looking at platform loadouts. A B-17 Flying Fortress in the G model carried up to 13 M2s, many in twin mounts spread across turrets and crew stations. A P-47 Thunderbolt carried eight, four in each wing. The Douglas A-26 Invader could mount as many as 18, with eight in the nose, four in each wing, and two in a turret. Early in the war, this was a clear upgrade over the lighter 30 caliber guns still on some aircraft. The 50 balanced a usable rate with single shot energy that was enough to bring down fighters and bombers when hits were made. With armor piercing ammunition, it could penetrate engine blocks. Concentrated fire from several guns at once was effective against hard ground targets too. 
American pilots used that to strike locomotives and armored vehicles, and even to threaten tanks from above, since roof armor was usually the thinnest on the vehicle. Back on the ground and at sea, the picture was similar. Ship mounts gave close-in air defense that crews trusted. Vehicle mounts put a heavy weapon on platforms that otherwise carried rifle-caliber guns. Tripod teams had a system that dominated open approaches, even if moving it was real work. What began as a specific reply to armor in the First World War turned into a general-purpose heavy gun in the Second World War, mainly because the same core action could be adapted across so many roles without redesigning everything from scratch. That path was gradual. It ran from a heavy, water-cooled prototype that strained crews, to a refined receiver that swapped feed direction in minutes, to a set of barrel options that let the same mechanism live on ships, vehicles, aircraft, and ground mounts. The modular idea eased logistics and training. A crew could learn one gun and then see it in different contexts without relearning the basics. By the time the fighting hit its stride, Crews wanted the heavy barrel 50 on anything that moved. Tanks, half-tracks, trucks, even soft skins if there was a place to bolt a pintle. Production followed that demand. By 1945, there were millions of M2s in service, which made it the most produced machine gun of the war. German units complained about it constantly because they ran into it everywhere. Low passes with fighters or dive bombers, like the Stuka, turned risky fast when every jeep and turret seemed to answer with a 50. Tankers mounted it with air defense in mind. On many tanks, the gun sat at the rear of the turret. A crewman climbed onto the engine deck to work it so he could angle up for incoming aircraft. It was the right arc for the job, but he was outside the armor while he fired, and everyone knew the risk. Now, if you have ever wondered why the Browning's barrel slides back when it fires, here is the short version. The M2 uses short recoil operation. Barrel and bolt start locked together and move to the rear as one unit the moment the shot breaks. That keeps the case supported while pressure is still high so it doesn't tear during extraction. After roughly 10 millimeters of travel, the barrel stops. The bolt keeps going, pulls the empty case and throws it clear. That rearward run compresses the recoil spring. The spring then drives the bolt forward again, strips the next round from the disintegrating link belt, chambers it, and the cycle repeats as long as the trigger is held. So how did the Germans see all this? They hated it for several reasons. The American way of fighting leaned hard on volume of fire, and the United States didn't run short of ammunition the way Germany did. German infantry kept meeting heavy machine guns on trucks, on tanks, on half-tracks, and on airfields. Getting hit by a 50 is not the same as taking rifle caliber fire. The 50 BMG outranged lighter machine guns, and in terms of energy, it delivered five to 10 times more than the rounds most infantry weapons used. Put it next to the eight millimeter Mauser round from an MG42, and the difference is obvious. That power changed what counted as cover. Brick and concrete walls stopped being safe. A single round could punch through and kill the man behind it. And if the first hit didn't get through, a held burst into one spot could break a wall or chew through a sandbag nest. Even a Panzer IV could suffer under heavy 50 caliber fire. Side or rear hits could find a way in. Optics, tracks and turret rings could be damaged or jammed. In the Pacific, the effect was even clearer. Lightly armored Japanese tanks that charged American positions in Banzai attacks were stopped by 50s more than once. Tank crews opened up and knocked them out with gunfire that wouldn't have mattered against heavier armor. One more thing that gets people talking is the claim that the Geneva Conventions banned the 50 against personnel. That was a myth. There was no such ban. The reason the story stuck is simple. The effect on a human body is severe. A hit to a limb often means the limb is gone. A hit to the torso or head is usually fatal. The physics aren't subtle. This isn't the place for graphic details, but you can imagine what a round that can break walls does to flesh and bone. German troops understood that and changed tactics where they could. Rather than push straight at a 50, they use snipers, tanks, mortars, and artillery to take out the gun or force it to move. It also grated on them that they had no real equivalent in general service. German heavy machine guns in the field were the MG-34 or MG-42 on the Lafette tripod. The Lafette was clever and very stable, and it stretched the useful range of those guns, but the 8mm cartridge couldn't match the punch of a half-inch round. 
The closest thing Germany had in that caliber class was a 13mm gun and that lived mostly on fighter aircraft. They did plan to mount captured M2s on U-boats as anti-aircraft weapons while recharging batteries on the surface, and they even produced copies of 50 BMG ammunition for that use. Actual fielding was rare, but the fact they prepared for it shows the respect the weapon earned. Since the cartridge is doing the real work, it helps to know what types were common. Standard ball is a full metal jacket round, and it already hits hard. Armor-piercing variants were made in several marks and could go through about one inch of hardened steel. Incendiary rounds were designed to set flammable material alight, which mattered against aircraft that leaked fuel after a hit. Armor-piercing incendiary combined penetration with ignition. Add a tracer element and you get armor-piercing incendiary tracer, which helps gunners see where their rounds are landing so they can correct on the fly. That feedback is useful for anti-aircraft fire and for long shots on the ground because 50 BMG stays effective past 2 kilometers. Belts were built for the job at hand. Ground use often ran a tracer every fifth round, so a gunner could walk fire onto a target without lighting up the whole belt. Aircraft belts mixed armor-piercing, incendiary, and tracer in patterns tuned for dogfights or for strafing runs. The point was always the same. Put the right mix of rounds into the target set, then let the platform do its work. Put all of that together and you see why the Heavy Barrel 50 ended up everywhere. It was a flexible weapon to mount, with a cartridge that solved many problems at once, and that combination forced the enemy to change how they fought. After the war, the ammunition menu for the 50 got a lot more sophisticated. The Raufoss multi-purpose round bundled several effects into one cartridge. It used a hard penetrator at the core, then added a small explosive and an incendiary compound that also throws fragments when it goes off. In practice, it acts like a tiny 20mm shell, just packaged for a 50 BMG gun. Another path was SLAP, the Sabotted Light Armor Penetrator. It follows the same idea you see in tank guns with discarding sabots. A small, very dense subcaliber dart, usually tungsten, rides in a plastic sabo and sheds it after leaving the muzzle. You get far better penetration for the same bore size, which makes it useful against light armored vehicles and even helicopters. Because it's expensive and overkill for spraying, people tend to run slap in single shot rolls from rifles rather than burn it in long bursts. That ties into the other big shift. The cartridge impressed the US military enough that they built dedicated rifles around it. In Vietnam, Carlos Hathcock tried something unusual. He put a telescopic sight on an M2 and used it to take single shots at ranges where smaller sniper rounds struggled. He didn't just try it once, he made confirmed kills that way. That experiment pushed the idea forward and helped set the stage for the Barrett M82, an anti-material rifle in 50 BMG that later became well known in US service. Now if one heavy machine gun answers a lot of problems, four of them solve a different set. The M45 Maxon mount took four 50s, linked their controls, and turned them into a mobile low-altitude air defense system. A single 50 had the punch to bring down an aircraft, but your window on a fast pass was short and the rate of fire was modest. Multiply by four and you're putting roughly 40 rounds a second into the air. Germany fielded a similar concept with quad 20mm cannon, which was more powerful per gun, but heavier, and built mainly for anti-aircraft sites. The Maxon unit was simpler, lighter, and easier to repurpose. The mount was electrically powered, so the turret could swing quickly through a full circle and elevate to near vertical to grab a target. You could park it on the ground as a point defense, or bolt it to a vehicle. Once Allied air superiority grew, crews didn't need to hold it only for air targets. They turned it on ground targets for infantry support. Four 50s digging into one spot is decisive. The system didn't end with 1945 either. It served in Korea and Vietnam, and soldiers even mounted it on trucks to guard road convoys against ambush. The flip side of having that kind of firepower is that the enemy makes you their priority. 50 caliber gunners are loud, visible, and easy to spot when they open up. The report is distinct. The muzzle flash and smoke give away the position. For too long, many vehicle and tank mounts left the gunner exposed from the chest up. Shields weren't standard until later in the Vietnam era. Even decades after that, early Humvees often rolled without proper protection until losses in urban fighting forced the issue. That led to enclosed turrets and then to remote weapon stations like crows. With a remote mount, the gunner stays inside the armor and works a joystick and a screen. 
laser range finders, night vision, and thermal imaging help with target ID and fire control. The same stations can also run other machine guns or an automatic grenade launcher, so units can pick what fits the mission without changing the rest of the kit. As for the gun itself, the arc from question mark to standard kit is hard to ignore. The core action that started taking shape in the First World War is still here. Over the years, the details changed less than you might expect. The recent visible step is the M2A1 configuration. It adds a better barrel change system a flash suppressor, and a manual safety. Beyond that, it remains the same machine many crews already know. People say the same thing about the MG42 line, living on in modernized form. With the Browning, the point is even stronger. The design comes out of the last century's first global war and still earns its keep. The platform and the caliber continue to do jobs that matter, and there's no real sign of retirement on the horizon.